do a visualization. Imagine you're it's 1968, you're 18 or 19 years old, and you're living in Haight-Ashbury, and you are a full-on hippie. And you have now become a devotee. So before you were a devotee, you were getting high every day. You had a different girlfriend, a boyfriend every few weeks. You were living in different places every few weeks. You didn't really have a place. You were just hanging out, playing your guitar, singing. And now you've become a devotee. Then all of a sudden, one day, Malati finds some Jagannath deities in the store. She doesn't know what they are, but they're from India. So she takes one and shows it to Prabhupada. And Prabhupada sees it and he pays obeisances. And he says, are there any more? And she says, yeah, there were two others. And Prabhupada says, go get them. She gets them. She doesn't know what they are. And Prabhupada says, Lord Jagannath has come and we need someone to carve larger deities. And so happens that her husband can do that. And her husband carves these deities. Which for us as Americans look something like maybe Indian, like um, or some primitive kind of what we call totem pole. You know totem pole? You know, different faces on it. It was just, it's nothing like we've ever seen before. And then Prabhupada says, this is Krishna, <clears throat> and then he gives us this process of worshiping, which we've never seen before, and tells us to feed these figures, and wake them up, and bathe them, and dress them. That's like a pretty big leap of faith. I mean, you're just, you know, off the street. And there's no senior devotees, there's no MIHG, VIHG, Kirtan Academy, Mayapur. There's just like ten other hippies who've become devotees. You know, 400 miles away there's 20, and a thousand miles away there's six, and the total population of Viscon is about 200 at that point. And there you are, and now it's your seva to take care of those deities. <coughs> Now, fortunately, you've taken so much LSG that you could believe anything. So it's not a big problem. But um, you have absolute faith in Prabhupada because you've never met anybody like him. And whatever he says, you accept. And so if, this, if he says this is Krishna, you accept it. But you have absolutely no realization of this is Krishna. All you have is faith and a process. So you have a process of deity worship and faith that your guru said, this is non different than Krishna. Krishna is here. And you do it. And what happens? You do it every day. And what happens after a while? you start to become attached to what you thought was just a piece of wood. And you're worried about feeding Lord Jagannath and clothing him and buying new jewelry and cook, learning how to cook better and so on. Right? That's what happens. And at some point, mysteriously, you become attached to what you thought was a piece of wood like it's God. Amazing. Now I have to tell you another story. 
This is one of, for me, this was one of the high points of my career as a devotee. In 1983, I was in Mauritius and I was the president in 1982. And we installed Radha Krishna deities. You know, big Radha Krishna deities. And in, installing deities is very special, and it's very special if you're the president, because it's like your deities become like your deities. So we were renting the building, and we wanted to buy the building, and we thought the building would sell for maybe like a equivalent of 100,000 U.S., and I think he wanted like a million. So it was like there was no way we could keep the building, and we were shocked. So... We were able to buy some land. We thought, well, let's build a temple. Well, for for 100,000 or so, we can build a nice temple. But the problem was that we had to move out of that house because he wanted to sell it. And because we're not buying it, he didn't want us there. So we didn't have any place for the deities. But there was another temple. So we, we thought, maybe within a year, we'll build a temple. We'll give those deities to be taken care of by the other temple, and then in a year, we'll build a new temple. This is kind of an awkward situation because normally, when you establish deities in a city, they stay in that city, right? You don't give them away normally. So we didn't have any place for the deities, so we gave the deities to this other temple, and they took care of them. And at that time, all they had was Gornitai. So now they have Radha Krishna, which is kind of a big thing for them. So they have to get their altar together, they have to get their kitchen together. So, to make a long story short, it took us six years before we were ready to take the deities back. So what do you think happened after six years of the deities being in this other temple when we called them up and said, now it's time for them to come back? What do you think they said? There's a saying in America like, go fly a kite, or go take a hike, which is like, forget it, you know. You know, like what you just said um, is irrelevant to my life, go take a hike. See you later, I don't want to hear it. They actually refused to give the deities back. And of course, we in our temple were very attached to those deities because they're our deities. And so we're meditating on them all the time and waiting for this day. We can bring them back and the day finally comes. And by that time, they say, we're not giving them back. We are too attached. We've worshipped them for six years. We're not letting them go. So there was a big fight. And I don't like to lose fights. <laughs> but somehow or other, we won. With great reluctance, they brought the deities. And with great feelings of separation, they had to relinquish, relinquish the deities. So there was a lot of emotion over these deities from both sides. From our side, it was meeting. From their side, it was separation. And I was right in the middle of this whole thing because I had come back and Krishna arranged that I would come back and be the president again at the time when the deities were installed. So it was like the second time I was there they were installed. And I was in the middle of this and I was watching this. And the emotions were really flying high, like very intense. It was probably the most intense emotions I've ever experienced in my life as a devotee or amongst the top. And it was obvious that those deities were Krishna and everybody realized that by serving. So why am I telling stories about deities at Kirtan Academy? Because the deity manifests in different forms. Wood, stone, earth, manifest in your mind, metal, and they also manifest in sound. Because sound is a material element, right? Earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, ego, and then sound. Sound is a material element. So if Krishna can incarnate in earth or metal, he can incarnate in sound. So he incarnates in sound. And in one lecture, Prabhupada said, 
When we see the deities, when the curtains open, we bow down. And so that when you chant Hare Krishna, you should bow down because Krishna is there. So, just as we, as hippies in San Francisco, maybe in your last life you were there, I don't know, it's possible. You could have been there also. So, as hippies, in San Francisco or in other temples where we're given deities and told this is Krishna and with faith worship them and then at some point become attached. The same way we are told Krishna is in his name, which makes no sense at all to our materially conditioned mind. Right? Because we have no experience of that. And if we don't get this and don't treat the holy name as Krishna we're bound to make some offense that's the cause of the offense it's just we're taking the holy name as a sound or as a process but not as Krishna now I read something really interesting that Prabhupada said he said this is the world of duality. So in the world of duality, you and your name are different. Right? You and your qualities are different. You and your form are actually different, we're the soul. And then Prabhupada said, in the spiritual world, there's no duality. So name, form, qualities, pastimes, there's no difference. In the material world, name, form, quality, pastimes, there's difference. I think of your pastimes, but that's not the same as being with you. You know, you're traveling, you're away from your family, and then you say, "Well, oh, just put a picture on the altar. I'll, I'm in my picture, and you know, chant my name. We'll be together." It doesn't work. You're not your name. Well, it works if you're transcendental. If you're pure devotee, it works. So the nature of the spiritual is that the name and the form and the qualities and the pastimes, they're the same. Isn't that interesting? The name is the form. Now Prabhupada said something really interesting about this. He said, intellectually you could never understand this. So. I will request you, don't try to understand what I just said because you'll be wasting calories, brain calories that you won't understand. Prabhupada said, you cannot understand. It's just intellectually, here I am, physically, you are in my presence. And if you go home and say, Mahatma Prabhu, I'm not there. You can't have my association. If you say apple, you don't get an apple. If you say water, you don't get water. So how is it that there's no difference between Krishna's name and Krishna? Now we're all thinking, Krishna's name is nice, but if I could see Krishna, that would be amazing. Right? You've all thought like that, I'm sure. Raise your hand if you haven't thought like that. <laughs> something wrong with these guys. <laughs> um, if I could just see Krishna, a lot of devotees think, you know, I have so many problems, but if I could just see Krishna, it's all, all the problems would be gone. And every day we're seeing Krishna as holy name and we don't realize it. So the reality is, all our problems wouldn't be gone if we saw Krishna because we wouldn't see him if we saw him. To the degree that we realize Krishna is holy name, that, to that degree we would see him. Personally, when we see him. When we see the deity, that's Krishna. Or we see him. Hmm? Someone. So, my personal experience in chanting and teaching about chanting is that all offenses stem from minimizing this point because we don't realize it. We can chant Hare Krishna and fall asleep. What realization 
is there that Krishna is in this name? How could you fall asleep in front of Krishna? That would be amazing if you could do it. Even if some you were tired and some devotee dressed up as Krishna walked in here, that would wake you up, right? A little bit. So, if I could fall asleep chanting the name of Krishna, that means I don't yet fully realize Krishna is in his name. And that becomes a problem which we need to overcome. So, the reason I told the story of the deities is because I... My understanding is that when we chant, we have to treat the holy name as Krishna whether or not we realize it. We have to honor it and worship it as Krishna whether or not we realize it. Otherwise, we'll tend to make offenses. We'll tend to minimize it. I don't know if you discussed this yet, but in the Jaiva Dharma, Bhaktivedanta Thakur says, that the second offense, consider the names of demigods like Lord Shiva or Lord Brahma to be equal to or independent of the name of Krishna, there's another aspect of that offense is to consider Krishna and his name to be different. That's also offense. Did you discuss that? No, yeah, it's, the, it's not apparent because it doesn't say that, but Shiva also means auspicious. So to consider the auspicious name Shiva consider Shiva the auspicious name of Krishna to be different than Krishna is also the same thing. Isn't that interesting? It's an offense to not fully realize or treat the holy name as Krishna. To treat the pastimes, the name, and the qualities as different than the form different than the person. So when you say, oh, if you ever say, oh, I w if I could just see Krishna, all my problems would be solved. It's actually an offense to the holy name to say that. Because you're minimizing the name, making the name not Krishna. Making the name something less than Krishna. That's the second offense. Interesting, isn't it? Now, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur explained this problem. It's kind of a what we call in English a vicious cycle. You, you, you do one thing wrong it creates another problem. And that second problem creates you to do the first thing wrong. And the first thing creates you to do you keep getting worse. It's called a vicious cycle. So what's the vicious cycle? If we don't chant trying to avoid the offenses then we don't get much realization that Krishna is in His name. If we don't get much realization that Krishna is in His name, we don't treat the name as Krishna. If we don't treat the name as Krishna, then it goes in a cycle where, we're, where our chanting becomes, it tends to become ritualistic. I have to get my rounds done, but I'm not experiencing Krishna's presence. So Bhakti Siddhanta said, the problem with that is when we're not experiencing the holy name, our faith in the name starts to dwindle and it's really hard to understand Krishna's in his name. And then we say things like, I really like kirtan, but I really don't like japa. It's actually an offense to the holy name. As I just said, Krishna with music is there and Krishna without music doesn't seem to be there. Basically what we're saying, right? Krishna with a good rhythm and a good tune. I like you without a good rhythm and tune. I don't really like it so much. So the, the vicious cycle can be reversed because if we chant well, we get realization. When we get realization, we appreciate Krishna's name, we get some experience. Okay, so this is the foundation of what I want to build upon. Treating the holy name as Krishna, in theory, that's the beginning, we don't have realization. That's okay if we don't have realization, that's not expected. But at least I can honor the holy name as Krishna, I can start there. 
just like, I don't know, Jagannath's there, it just looks like wood, but my Guru Maharaj said, he's there, I treat him, I bow down, I treat him as God, I offer food. Can you imagine how weird that was for the first devotees? The offering of deity food, waking him up, putting him to sleep, required sufficient faith, right? So, that's what they did. So the same faith. I, I, my Guru Maharaj said, this name Krishna is an incarnation of Krishna in sound. He, as Prabhupada said, in Kali Yuga, this is the incarnation of Krishna. He comes as Nam Avatar. Incarnated in sound. I have that faith. That's him. He's in sound. I don't realize it. Sometimes I chant, I'm bored. Sometimes I chant, I sleep. Sometimes I chant, I get distracted, which obviously wouldn't happen if Krishna were sitting in front of me. Right? If you get bored, Krishna, can you go? I heard the funniest lecture today. Oh my God, this was so funny. The devotee was saying, we may not be ready to be pure devotees, because if we say, Krishna, you know, whatever you want, I just surrender, and then we're pure and the deity talks to us and tells us what he wants us to do, we'll close the curtains and say, that's enough. <laughs> I don't want to hear anymore, I'm not ready to do all that. I want the deity to talk to me. Then he'll tell you what to do, and you'll say, I don't know if I want to do that. <laughs> Isn't that funny? And true? Right? So, um, so, my guru said Krishna is in his name. Ah, uh, doesn't make sense to my head. I have no experience with that. And. Um, it doesn't make sense to my heart because I'm not feeling that. How do I get over that? Just as we learn to worship the deity, we learn to worship the holy name by accepting this is Krishna and when I'm chanting, I'm with Krishna. And therefore, I honor the name as Krishna. Even I have no realization, I honor the name of Krishna. And that's how I get realization that Krishna is in his name, by treating the name as Krishna. If I treat the name according to my realization, how do I treat him? This is the problem that I see in my travels in helping devotees improve their chanting. Many, many devotees have taken their japa as something they have to do and something they don't really like to do, but it's a vow. So they've taken it more in a religious way. A religious way meaning it's kind of like a ritual that we do every day, but not done with much realization or, or much um, feeling or much attraction. Just more as a ritual. 16 rounds I must do every day. And in doing it more ritualistically, what I've seen for many is that japa becomes a process rather than a relationship. So this is really important. If you're taking notes, write this down. Japa has become more of a process than a relationship. So what does process mean? There are nine processes of devotional service. What does process mean in our head? Process doesn't mean relationship, does it? Process means a formula. Formula and relationship are really two very different things. Relationships are more natural and spontaneous. Processes are more regulated, forced. Isn't it? This is the process. Step A, step B, step C, step B. And then you follow the process. Now, even when we're given good instructions about how to chant, some of us processize that. Sit straight, chant this way, chant this direction, here. And then it starts to become a process where the whole focus is, well, I'm just trying to sit properly, pronounce, and hear. And it becomes a little mechanical, right? 
a little, it can be mechanical and it can be divorced from the relationship. So I'm doing the process, I'm hearing, I'm sitting properly and so forth. What about the relationship? If it's a process, then it's, it starts to become a little disconnected. Do you agree? Raise your hand if you agree. If you don't raise your hand, you'll be thrown off the balcony. <laughs> Guru Apara. Throw him off the balcony. Um, Okay, let me tell you something. When I teach about japa, I get many questions. What about this? What about that? What about this? What about that? The majority of the questions are process questions. Can, is it okay to chant walking? Is it okay to chant standing? Is it better I face the east? If, I, if I'm dirty, and I, you know, it's too cold in the morning, I don't take bath, is it better I chant on a counter than touch my Tulsi beach? It's on and on and on. Um, how long does it, how long should it take? Oh, between five and ten minutes. No, I need exactly. I need to know exactly how long it should take. You'd be surprised. I get these questions. And I'm saying, well, it's not exact. No, I, then they keep going. I need to know exactly. I have to do it right. That's, you understand what I mean by process? It's not relationship oriented. It's like, it's like the whole thing is, what's the exact perfect direction, the perfect timing, the, and how do I pronounce it? I got to learn the proper pronunciation, which actually some of us can't pronounce properly because of the accents we grew up with. So you know, now what do we do? No, it's not Krishna. Krishna. But I can't say, Krishna, go to hell. <laughs> go to hell. You're not chanting. No. This is one of the most interesting things that I can tell you about process versus relationship. Most of you do not, are not even chanting the Hare Krishna mantra because you're pronouncing it wrong. What do you think of that? Isn't that interesting? I would say the majority of devotees are not actually pronouncing what to speak of Bengalis. Kisno. Kisno. Lord Chaitanya used to make fun of like the Bengali accent. Or a certain kind of Bengali accent used to make fun of. So, you know, Kis, Kisno, when Prabhupada said, what is this Kisno, Ramo? So technically speaking, we're mispronouncing. Whatever, however you say it, right? technically speaking, we're mispronouncing. We're not even chanting Hare Krishna. We're chanting something else. We go to China sometimes. Um, my name in China is Mahatma Prabhu. <laughs> That's my name in China. Mahatma Prabhu. <laughs> Mahatama. Mahatama Pabu. That's my Chinese name. <laughs> um, so there's limitations, right? So there's a story. I think this is I think this is one of the most interesting things to break this process oriented chanting. There was a man who was complaining to Prabhupada that your disciples, they don't know how to pronounce the holy name. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. That's the, how to pronounce it. Now if you're from Mexico, it's Rama, Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And if you're from France, it's like Rama, Hare Rama. <laughs> How do I know? Because I've been to all these places. Heard devotees chanting. So this man came to Prabhupada and he's hearing all these devotees with their Krishnas and Your disciples do not know how to pronounce 
the holy name. And Prabhupada said, I know. And he said, but Krishna knows who they're calling. Krishna knows who they're calling. So what's more important? Your heart or your pronunciation? Isn't that interesting? Because we say Krishna's in his name. And if you're calling Krishna and mispronouncing it, Krishna's still there because it's not a material process. I'll tell you something else. Isn't that interesting? You find that interesting? I'll tell you something else that Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur said. He said it's just like the deity, Krishna's like the deity, that you have to call Krishna to descend in the deity. It's not just there. You have a ceremony, you install the deity and say, Krishna, please come. He said it's like that with chanting because when you chant, you have to call Krishna into his name and you call Krishna into his name by your attitude of service. By your attitude with which you chant, Krishna descends in his name, not by the pronunciation. Not by the way you sit or pronounce or necessarily how well you hear, but what you are asking or the mentality you put into the chanting. Krishna, I want to serve you. As Srila Bhakti Siddhanta said, when you put the mentality of service into the mantra, Krishna descends into it. So he said something which is a little different than what Prophet has told us. Not entirely different, it just takes explanation. But he said, Krishna is not in his name. Wow! Have you ever heard that before? Krishna is not in his name. But he descends in his name when it's chanted with the attitude of, I want to serve you. Then Krishna is in his name. Isn't that interesting? So you can chant Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare perfectly sitting straight you know, big yogi but if you don't have the mood of service Krishna is absent you've got the process but not Krishna everything's great it's just missing one thing Krishna it's a minor detail in your job <laughs> I chanted some really good rounds, I pronounced them properly, everything was good. Only one problem, Krishna didn't show up for those rounds. So, it, we have to start from this platform that maybe I don't realize Krishna's there, but I have to treat him like he's there. I have to treat him like he's there. When I'm chanting, I have to treat Krishna as if he's there. So that's kind of the foundation um, of, I think, everything I want to talk about in the next five days. But I want you to get this first. Understand the difference between ritual, between process and relationship. Now, one time, some devotees met the neighbor of Bhaktivinoda Thakur. Oh, by the way, if you want to go to Bhaktivinoda Thakur's house, we're going to go tomorrow. We're going to chant our rounds to Bhaktivinoda Thakur. So if you meet at Panchatattva entrance about 5.15, we'll go, take a boat, walk to his house, chant a few rounds and come back. If you're into... Yeah, it's a good place to go. If you like to come, you're invited. So Bhaktivinoda Thakur had a neighbor. And some devotees got to meet the neighbor. And the neighbor said, I used to hear him chanting. So naturally the devotees said, well, how did he chant? And it said, it's, he chanted as if he was calling Krishna, like Krishna was outside and he was calling him to come. Hare Krishna! <laughs> Hare Krishna! Krishna Krishna! Hare Hare! Hare Ram! Hare. Ram Ram! Hare Hare! Um, and interestingly, Prabhupada told I forget who, I'm not sure. Prabhupada said, when you chant Hare Krishna, Krishna comes. We don't see him. But he comes, he shows up. And he says, you were calling me, what do you want? What are you asking for? What do you need? Isn't that interesting? Did you know that? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, you're calling Krishna. So, so he comes. And he's asking you, what do you want? 
And what are you thinking? Well, I just want to sit straight, <laughs> pronounce properly, hear, don't fall asleep, and somehow or other block out this two hours so it's not so painful. Yeah. That's my prayer. Is that the perfection of Chapa? So Prabhupada said, Krishna's coming and he's asking, what do you want? So that's Japa. It's, it's where you ask Krishna for pure devotional service or anything connected with pure devotional service. That's, that's where the relationship comes. That's relational Japa as opposed to process Japa. And if we get this, everything changes. Everything becomes sweeter. Now, I have noticed that due to upbringing, certain people are very ritualistically inclined. So even though you tell them it, it's not, there's not an exact time to chant or an exact amount of time for each round, they're kind of relentless. They need to know. So, so if you have that kind of conditioning where you're very attached to ritual and external, it may be a little more difficult to transcend this or purify this. But, um, please understand that when you really go deeply into understanding what kirtan is or what japa is, that you see it's, it's connection relationship. So, you all know the bad news that a long, long time ago um, we all decided to turn away, turn our back, Shastra says, Bahir Mukha. We turned our back on Krishna. That was an unfortunate moment in our history, right? And Using that example or that actual event, when we chant japa, what are we doing? We're turning around. And what are we saying? We're saying, Krishna, I made a big mistake and I've suffered a lot. That's inherent in the meaning of japa, isn't it? You know what Prabhupada said japa means? You know what he said the Hare Krishna mantra means? He said, my dear Lord, I have served Maya for so many lifetimes, I have suffered so many lifetimes, I don't want to serve Maya anymore, I want to serve you. I'm so attracted to serving Maya, but I'm tired, I want to serve you, please give me service, please give me the desire to serve you. He said, that's the sentiment. So if you think that you've turned away from Krishna and your japa is turning you back, then automatically you understand the sentiment. Right? I have left you, I want to connect with you. That's the mood. Now what makes this mood really intense is Prabhupada said something very heavy. Should I tell you now? Have you digested your lunch? <laughs> he said something very heavy about this. He said, we actually don't have a right to ask Krishna to accept us pretty heavy, isn't it? Why don't we have a right? Because we left Krishna and now we have no right. I think Phil Collins had a song like that. Right? You have no right? Something like that? So, <clears throat> yes. So we have offended Krishna, all of us. We're all proud of our bodies, very smart, talented, beautiful. The body is a, a symbol that we offended Krishna. So don't be so proud of your body. It's a sign, a walking signboard that I turned my back to Krishna. Or I decided not to serve Krishna. So now I'm asking Krishna, please accept me. In 1968, this was a definition Prabhupada gave. Please accept me. That's the mood. I want to be accepted. I'm, I've served Maya and I've suffered. And now the mood intensifies when we realize we don't even have a right to ask. Pretty intense, right? <coughs> yes? But I have some good news for you. Prabhupada said, 
we can ask our Guru to ask Krishna to accept it. And by his mercy he will accept it. And we've also learned that the holy name is so merciful that even though we have offended Krishna, the holy name will come. And he will Krishna will come as the holy name. So Bhaktivinoda Thakur said, when you chant the holy name, you should meditate on what the holy name means. And these are two meanings that Prabhupada has given us. The Acharyas have given many meanings. But I'm just giving these two meanings because it gives you an idea of what chanting in the mood that Krishna will descend in his name is like what the mood is, what is the, um, what we call chanting within the relationship. That you're conscious that you're, you're talking to Krishna, and as Prabhupada said, you're opening your heart. Krishna's asking you what you want, and you're revealing it. And I want a relationship with you. Process, in my experience, process-oriented or chanting has at the root this problem where we're not dealing with the name as Krishna. That's, that's where it all comes from. And then we get more into the mood of this is a sadhana, and I have 16 rounds which I've committed to my guru. It's a sadhana, it's a duty, and I must finish it. And it's not relational. It becomes dharma. It's not premanam, it's dharmanam. And as our exalted God-brother, who is so responsible for giving uh, so many devotees a taste for the Holy Name, has said, My dear devotees, how long can you go on chanting without taste? You cannot go on forever without taste. It is not possible. You must get taste. So you, it, you can't just go on and process and duty and dharma without connection with the person Krishna, without that mood of prayer where you're honoring Krishna's presence in His name. It, you just, it won't last. The quality won't be there. The taste won't be there. So in my experience, <coughs> I feel that rooted, the root of all the offenses is this minimization of Krishna in his name. And just taking it as a dharma, as a duty, as a ritual, as something I have to do. I mean that, you know, that's, it's, um, it's unfortunate we feel that way. I don't think it's so unfortunate in the beginning, but if we've been chanting year after year after year and we still feel that way, that's unfortunate because it's, it's not supposed to be like that. Sometimes devotees, they ask me, I said, well, how do I know if my rounds are good? And I say, well, how do you feel on your, when you finish your rounds? And some devotees say, well, I feel like I'd like to continue chanting. I say, that, that means your rounds are good. Some devotees say, I'm happy that I've finished my chanting. So, if you're happy that you finished your chanting, that means the chanting was more, you're feeling more, this is like my dharma. I have to do this. And now it's over and there's some relief. That's unfortunate. Especially when there's so much nectar in the Holy Name. And so we're depriving ourselves of so much nectar. So sweet. Yes? Is the holy name sweet? Have you ever got a taste of it? We're supposed to get that taste every day and it's supposed to increase. Personally, I'm just being frank and this is not a criticism of anyone or anything, but I feel it's, it's one of the greatest misfortunes to not have a taste for the holy name because there's so much taste there and there's so much strength in the Holy Name. That's where we get 
most of our strength. And all the other processes are supporting our chanting. And if we don't get a taste for it, it's such a loss. And that's why Mahaprabhu said, I'm so unfortunate that I have no taste. So what could be a greater misfortune than to have something that is Ananda Bodhi Vardhanam and not to be able to experience it? Because we processed it. Instead of um, allowed Krishna to descend in his name through our mood. So, is that all right? Does anybody have any questions before we go on? Do you have any questions on that? Yes. You started to mention about the uh, meaning of whole name by Bhakti Gnotapur, like, like two, two meaning, main meanings. Um, no, he, Bhaktivinoda Thakur was saying you should meditate on what the holy name means. Well, for Bhaktivinoda, what does it mean? Bhaktivinoda Thakur said, I'm, when I chant the holy name, I'm drowning in an ocean of nectar. I feel like I'm drowning in an ocean of nectar. Wow. I'll just take a drop. We can go tomorrow and say, you know, you know that ocean you're drowning in? You know, could you throw a drop my way? That is, should be enough for me. Um, what Bhakti no Thakur meant by meditating on the meaning, the meaning is the feeling. Because if you study the meanings of the holy name given by different acharyas, they're not intellectual meanings. They're actually those great devotees' moods and chanting. So, if the holy name means Krishna, please, 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 whatever it is you're asking for, accept me in a relationship or purify me or whatever, and you're not in that mood, you're not connecting to what the holy name means. Then what does the holy name mean for you? It might mean, let me get my rounds done. But that's not the meaning of the holy name, but that could be the meaning for you. Look, I'll give you an example. I think it was 1975, some devotee wrongly created a kirtan competition and they hired all these, it allowed all these kirtan groups to come. And some of the kirtan groups were professional, so it was like, you know, American Idol or whatever those shows are. British has talent or that one in Lithuania, what's it called? The Tisoda's on, you know, those. Yeah. yeah, you know, have these, <coughs> you come and sing or your band plays. And, so they, they did the same thing here with Kirtan. Some devotee thought, it would be a good idea. I don't know why he felt like this. So they had these different Kirtan groups and I guess they had judges. I was, I wasn't, I was here in Mayapur but I wasn't at that event. And, but you could hear the Kirtan. And so there was one Kirtan you know, these professional groups. So professional groups, they try to chant in a way that's a materialistic people, you know, sing sweetly and so on. Yeah. Bengalis have sweet voices. I was here in Mayapur in 1975 and I was thinking, the Bengalis have such sweet voices and I'm serious. I walked down Bhakti Sananta Road and there was a shop and there was a three-year-old singing. I'm serious. It was like, you know, the sweet Bengali voice. So these, you can imagine these professional kirtans. You know, like materially, they're really sweet. How they do it, right? And so Prabhupada heard them chanting. And the thing about Prabhupada, because he's a pure devotee, he can feel everything. Like, like we, we're conditioned. So we're in the mode of passion, so we might like, you know, if we hear a Beatles song to Hare Krishna, we're like, hey, good. In fact, one time there was a kirtan, some Western melody, and Prabhupada stopped it. He stopped the kirtan. He said, it was in Mayapur. He stopped it and he said, take that kirtan back to the West, not here in India. So, did you know that? Uh, 
there was another time, I'll finish the story, but, but there was another time that Advoti is a very good musician, was going to lead Guru Puja for Prabhupada, and he had prepared, he had his men, his cartels, Madangas, and then he was chanting a verse they chant a Gaudiya Math before they do the Guru Puja. So he was chanting it very melodiously, very professionally. He's a, he's a really good musician. He had a really good band before he was the devotee. He was chanting like that, and all this man, and Prabhupada said, stop, get someone else to lead. The mood was just, Prabhupada feels it. He feels the mood. He stopped the kirtan, got someone else to lead. When um, the artist wanted to redo all the early paintings from 1970 Krishna book because they're, they're more proficient now. So they redid a lot of the painting, you know, the same scene and they redid it. And they brought it into Prabhupada and he rejected every painting. These paintings materially were at least ten times better than the ones in the Krishna book. And Prabhupada found fault with every one of them, some material fault. Like, not material externally, but in consciousness. The hair was too long, he said, you've made them all hippies, you're all hippies, you like hair, hippies, you know. <laughs> then another one, you know, you've made Krishna with muscles, he doesn't have a body like that, you know. Just, and the devotees are thinking, but those paintings in the original Krishna book, they're so, you know, they're like, they look like high school kids, or junior high school kids did them. And Prabhupada said, those paintings are wonderful. They're perfectly fine. Because he was feeling the devotion. He wasn't seeing it externally. So anyway, this kirtan party was going on, so this professional party was chanting, and everybody could hear, like that. Then Prabhupada said, they're not chanting Hare Krishna. It's kind of interesting, because that's what they were chanting. Is that an interesting statement? Yes. Prabhupada, there are, I hear Hare Krishna. No, they're not chanting Hare Krishna. Well, Prabhupada, what are they chanting? They're chanting money, money, money. Because <laughs> if they win the competition, they get money. Isn't that interesting? The Hare Krishna mantra is coming out of their mouth, but what's coming out of their consciousness? Money, money, money. So I have a question for all of you. What's in your mantra? Is it money? Is it fame? Is it this or that? Because Prabhupada is teaching, it's not an external process. The holy name is Krishna and the Maha Mantra is a connection through prayer for pure devotional service. So if we're chanting the holy name, but we're thinking money or I want to be God or whatever, then that's not the holy name. Yes? Sorry, I doubt if it's coming on your oh. Facebook page right now. Maybe because it's coming. It's coming? It's coming? That's my page? Yes. Thank you for the class. The question in regard to when we attract completely new people, how is the holy name work? Is it purified? Them? Yeah, okay. We explained this in the park. I'll explain it again. It's an interesting tattwa. Krishna consciousness has many interesting truths. You could spend lifetimes just discussing them. So nice. I give somebody on the street the holy name and they chant the holy name. They don't know what it means. So what happens? They become purified of sinful reactions by saying Krishna. 
But will they get love of Krishna by that chant, by that level of chanting? No, it has to be elevated. So they're not making an offense, but certainly their chanting is impure. So we can produce some some little bit of purity and it's also taken as unknown devotional service which can lead them to do devotional service if they continue chanting if they get the holy name from a pure devotee like you because you got it from a pure devotee and so the name is pure But if you want to develop love of Krishna, then you're going to have to chant without offenses. And to chant without offenses, you have to know what the offenses are. Where the people you give the holy name to, they don't need to know what the offense is because they're not yet... They're not yet... Um, seriously taking to Krishna consciousness. So let me, let me explain uh, three principles. Offensive chanting means chanting committing one or more of the ten offenses. Then the second stage, Nama Bas, is chanting with an effort to avoid the offenses, which means you need to know what they are. And lower stage of Nama Bas is also there for people who don't know the offenses, just new people, they're chanting. That's Nama Bas. But if, if they or we want to advance towards Shudanam, then we have to know what the offenses are and we have to avoid them. Otherwise, for non-devotees, they'll just stay on this very low level. Some purity, some bhakti, they're, they're accumulating bhakti sukriti, benefit of devotional service. But if they're going to go further, they're going to need knowledge. Sambandha means you need knowledge. And so you need knowledge how to chant. You need, you need to know who Krishna is. You know, when, when Prabhupada did the first initiations, you know what the qualification was? What you had to know to be initiated? You had to know that Krishna is God, and you're a servant, and then you could get initiated. Did you know that? So I think it was what Kunamara said, I want to get initiated, what do I have to do? And Prabhupada said, who is Krishna? He's the Supreme Personality of God. Who are you? I'm a servant. Okay, you can get initiated tomorrow. <laughs> so, because then when you know that, then you can chant in relationship. And then your chanting can then evolve gradually towards Shudana. But for the average person who doesn't know that, all they can do is Nama Bas on a low level. Now, the problem is, when, when you want to take seriously Krishna Consciousness, then you're held responsible for making offenses. Because <coughs> as we know, when you know what's wrong and you commit the mistake, it's more offensive than if you don't. So, for us, we need to know the offenses. So Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur has said that chanting without making an effort to avoid the offenses is nam aparat. You're chanting for some material benefit, or you're offending Vaishnavas, or you you don't have proper knowledge of Krishna. You think Krishna is like any other demigod, you think chanting is like any other karmic activity or religious activity, offenses like that. You're using it to counteract sin, all these offenses. You're not taking it seriously. So he said, if you make an effort to avoid those offenses, then you're on Namabas. Second stage. Not that you're avoiding, but you're trying to avoid it. That's a really important distinction. Because this discussion about Namaparat could become quite depressing when you realize you make offenses. The Prabhupada said it's not Namabas is not or Namaparat is not that you make offenses. 
the problem is not trying to avoid. Sometimes you try to avoid and you make, right? Have you ever criticized a devotee? Probably, right? Yeah. Have you done it more than once? Probably. Have you done it a few times today? Probably. So, we know that's an offense, but we do it, and then after we do it, we regret it. We think, oh, why did I do that? That's not right. So we're, we're going to try to be better. We're going to try to avoid it tomorrow. Or maybe we didn't concentrate today, we're going to try tomorrow. So, Bhakti Siddhanta and Prabhupada said, trying is what prevents you from nama parat. You're trying. You're just trying. Whether you succeed or not, that may take time, but at least you're trying. Then it's not offensive. So that's encouraging, right? I'm trying to control my mind, but I just had this huge fight with so-and-so Prabhu, and my mind during japa is reeling and I can't control it. You know, I, I dumped it in ice cold water for a half hour, that still didn't work. I took a nap, that still didn't work. I ate a sweet ball, it still didn't work. Nothing worked, my mind is... It's just disturbed. I had a big fight with my best friend. It's disturbed by, you know, I'm trying to control it. That's inattention. But the fact is that you tried. So it's not an offense. And then Srila Bhakti Siddhanta described that Shudhanam is chanting and there's no offense. It's completely pure. So we are traversing on the path of Namabhas. Now, it's very interesting. Do you know what happens in the stage of Baba? That, in that stage you realize the name is Krishna, that full realization. That's why there's ecstatic symptoms, because you experience it. And so pretty much on the lower stages of chanting there's little realization that Krishna is in his name, and the higher stages, there's full realization. So as you advance through Namabhas, you get closer and closer to that full realization. So you start experiencing Krishna in his name a little more, a little more, a little more. And then you finally come to a point where you actually like to chant. Like picking up this speed bag is the most exciting part of your day. It's like this is like so exciting. And you start chanting and, and you're thinking and feeling like this is like I am so fortunate to have the Holy Name. There's nothing better than this. I can just do this all day. Wouldn't that be nice? Well, through Nam through trying to avoid the offenses every day, this is what happens. Trying to avoid the offenses throughout the day and while you're chanting. This is what happens. Where did it go? Oh my god. It fell down or it's never there? Oh. It was never there. No, it was. It was just one. Yeah, my <laughs> microphone's offending me. This one was, so I've heard all this before. I'm bored. Um, if you treat the holy name as a person, it will transform your japa, and I'll explain why. Sometimes we say things like, I have to chant my rounds. Now, if you were with Krishna and Krishna said, you want to go on a walk together for two hours? And you said, Mahatma, where are you going? And I said, well, I have to go on a walk with Krishna. That would be really weird. And how would Krishna say, well, you don't have to go if you don't want to. You know, I'm just inviting you. If you don't like me, that's fine. Right? So, because we don't personalize the holy name, we don't realize that we're saying these things. We don't realize how we're treating the Holy Name. I have to chant my rounds. What does that mean? Krishna, you know, you're cool, but you know your name, like two hours? I don't know. 
I don't really want to do it. You know? I mean, I'll do it because I promise, you know, I have to do it. So, how does Krishna feel? Now, we'll talk about this tomorrow, but, but Aparad is such an interesting topic because Aparad means Krishna's feelings are hurt. Did you know that? That, that essentially what Aparad means is Krishna's feelings are hurt. You offend the holy name, you offend the Dham, you offend the deity, you offend the Vaishnava. That hurts Krishna's heart. That's what it means. Isn't that interesting? Like, you know, we all know. If you offend a devotee, Krishna feels offended because the devotee is dear to Krishna. So what's happening? Krishna feels offended. And in fact, Shastra says, Krishna can't even tolerate an offense. That means it's hurting him so much, he can't tolerate it. That's all about his feelings. Isn't that interesting? God cannot tolerate an offense committed against his devotee because it hurts him so much. Because that devotee is so dear to him. So Aparad is personal. It's per Krishna's personally being offended. That we're minimizing the holy name. That hurts. Krishna's in his name. That hurts him. Isn't that interesting? So you can see how when we impersonalize the holy name, we don't treat it as Krishna. It becomes quite fertile soil for committing Aparad. Isn't it? It's interesting, isn't it? And so the more you treat Krishna as person, the more you'll start to realize when you're not treating him as a, him as a person, you say things like, oh, you look at your counter beads, you go, oh my God, still, I thought I finished my rounds, oh, I still have three left. What did you just do? You just offended the Holy Name. And you didn't realize it. Yes? When you personalize, you, you'll realize all these things. You'll catch yourself. It's time to chant in the morning. You put your hand in your beads. And what's going on inside of you at that point? <sighs> <laughs> what's going on? What's going on right there? That's not one listed as one of the ten offenses, but that's a culmination of offenses. It's like I don't want to do this. Krishna's in his name. He's personally present and you don't want to be there. Something's wrong. And you're feeling like, huh, oh, because you're processing it. And all the boredom is because you process it. You know? I, um, I have a theory, and you know, if I were 22 years old and doing a PhD, I would, in, in chanting Hare Krishna, I would do an experiment. I would give a hundred people the Coca-Cola mantra, Coca-Cola, 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 Coca-Cola. And I would give other people the Maha mantra. And I would make sure these people chant offensively. I would tell them how to do everything wrong. I said, I want you to chant this way. And compare the experiences. And I believe the experience of the Coca-Cola chanters and the Maha Mantra chanters will be very similar. Because they'd be treating the Maha Mantra basically like a Coca-Cola mantra. Just an impersonal sound of repetition. You see that with new people, sometimes new people, you give them beads and after like three minutes they, they can't chant. They're just because it's not to them it's not Krishna. They haven't got there yet. So when we process it, it's not Krishna. And then all those feelings like, oh no, I have to chant my around, so, so they don't want to do this. And you see your friend and you start talking. Because that's a lot more pleasant than chanting, right? Now if you're really good at Nam Aparad, this is what you do. This is how you get your own stuff. Take your beads and you talk. And while you're talking, you're, you're somehow in your mind chanting while you're talking. You get rounds done while talking. Have you ever done that? <laughs> I've done that before. To finish a conversation, then I'm like, I got a round done. I go, how did I do that? <laughs>
And it's like it's it's just testimony that's like it's like we don't like chanting, it's painful. So you know, it's like so I hope I mean that's the main point I wanted to make today before we get into it. In personalizing the holy name, not accepting Krishna as Krishna is really the source of all the other problems. And if we don't address this, by addressing the other problems without this, it may not be complete or as effective. Is that okay? So, we have 20 minutes. Yes? If I love somebody, like if I love my wife, I have to do certain things to do it. So if I love Krishna, I change my grounds as good as possible. Then I prove it that I love it. I'm also happy when I'm finished because there are other services to be done. Actually, you must consent to that. When we finished the 16 rounds, we were happy because we could go out from it. We never went out to the other rounds. Let me take the first name. If you love your wife, you have to... What is it? If I love my wife, I have to... Yes, they take care. Yeah. I would say... If you don't love... I would say... If I were an editor and you just wrote that, I would rephrase it and say, if I don't love my wife, I have to do certain things. If I love my wife, I get to do certain things. <laughs> All right. you, like go you like to go to the mall with your wife and she goes shopping? That's being a good dharmic husband. <laughs> when you first met your wife, okay, I have a, I have a, I think I can resolve this problem. <laughs> After you've been married, what you just said is true, you know. But when you first met her, if you were in love, wherever she goes, you go. And you're, you want to go where she goes. So. What? Yeah, that, it's a symptom of being in love. Yeah, that's my point. If, if the more there's love, the more you, you want to be. And the, the more there's duty, it's more like, there's a duty of love. You know? So I, I, don't un, I don't undermine, I don't want to undermine the duty of love for my guru that I'm chanting 60 rounds. But Prabhupada said something very, I don't know, it was very telling. At one time Prabhupada was talking about 16 bad rounds, and he was actually imitating how we chant improperly. You know. so he was, I, I forget what he was doing, but something, you know, Krishna Krishna Ram 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 Ram. He was imitating that, and he said, we don't chant that way. They said, that is not chanting. If you chant like that, you will never get love of Krishna. He said, but he didn't want to minimize the fact that we were chanting 16 rounds a day. He said, well, it's good that you chant 16 rounds a day. But he said something quite interesting. He said, you get the benefit of following your guru 16 rounds, but you don't get the benefit of the holy name because you didn't chant it properly. Isn't that interesting? So it's very good, you've kept your vow. But the problem is you're not chanting purely, so you're you're not gonna you're not gonna evolve to shoot Hanam unless you purify your chanting. You wanna hear something? Really amazingly inspiring and possibly depressing? You know, the offense, you know, to maintain material attachments. Bhaktivinoda Thakur said, another way of understanding that offense is to not love chanting Hare Krishna. That's an offense. Did you know that? Isn't that heavy? It's also an offense to not love chanting Hare Krishna. That's one of the offenses. To not have love, attraction for the Holy Name. So we, we want to get it a little beyond duty, past duty. There is the love of duty, I acknowledge that. 
but we want to get a, go further. Yeah, you finish your rounds. You want to do service. And you're in, you you got inspired by your chanting to do service. Yeah, that's nice. But we all know if our rounds are good, we like to chant more. It's not no longer a chore. We did an exercise in a, a couple Japa workshops, uh, Japa retreats around the world. And I think, yeah, Krishna's like, he goes with me, or I go with him. Yeah. I like that. So, tomorrow, uh, if you're not already doing this, you can try. See the Holy Name as the Incarnation in sound and treat the Holy Name as Krishna and see what happens. See if it changes. Because I think that's the cause of all the other offenses. And if you want to do something else tomorrow, which is very interesting, before you chant, and just put your hands in your beads, and before you chant, just sit there and try to notice what you're feeling right at that moment. You know, just put your hands in your beads and sit there and think, what am I feeling right now? And see what you're feeling. Are you feeling like, I'm so happy to be chanting, this is nectar. Am I feeling this is going to be hard? Am I feeling I don't want to do this? I'm hungry, I'm tired, whatever you're feeling. And as you progress in your chanting, you'll start to see that, that taste increases. So when you begin your chanting every morning, what you're feeling is much What's the word? More, you're you're looking forward to it more. You're feeling better about it. You're liking it more. And I don't know if all of you are aware of what you're feeling when you first put your hand in your bead bag. So it'll be, I think it'll be really nice for you tomorrow. Just put your hand in your bead bag and don't chant and just sit there and try to just feel what you're feeling. And for some of us, we're not used to doing that. But just sit there and say, what am I feeling right now? What's going on inside of me? And it will be very interesting to see. <coughs> and if the feeling is good, fantastic. And if the feeling isn't, then at least you brought awareness to some resistance or something's going on that I need to purify. And it's, you know, if I'm not feeling enthusiastic, it's Krishna and I'm spending time with him. And there's something wrong there, right? Yes? Yes? you have a question? She always has questions I can't answer. Any other questions? Yes? What time is the meeting tomorrow morning? 5.15? Yeah, 5.15, 5.20 at the latest. Yeah. We just walk up to Arampur Road, we go over, take a boat, Walk about 10 minutes to Bhakti Nath Thakur's house. Pray for some mercy. Get a drop of the ocean he's drowning in. And uh, walk back. Maybe we'll get back at 7.30 or something. 8 o'clock at the latest. Depending how long we want to stay there. You're all welcome. Question? No? So, should we do kirtan or what? Yes? Krishna Krishna Hari Ho. Okay. So, thank you for coming. It was nice to be here. We'll see you tomorrow. And now, we'll have some sunset kirtan. Sunset kirtan. Oh, we call it mosquito kirtan? <laughs> we will serenade the mosquitoes. We, no, it's prasadam distribution time. We will feed the mosquitoes. <laughs> Krishna, Krishna.